Well, I guess, I guess you all know I'm David Gordon, and uh, the purpose of this presentation tonight is to present a kind of overall framing that hopefully will help us to, to focus our discussions. It's a very large frame, and I think there's room within it for much of, or much of what everybody else in the room is working on. Um, it's all centered around my most recent book, The Great Turning from Empire to Birth and Community. Um, and I want to stress that this book, there's, there's nothing in this book that you don't already know. I'm not going to say anything tonight that you don't already know. But what is distinctive, if there's a distinctive aspect, is how I connect the dots. And it's a synthesis drawing from all the best minds that I can find to draw. And so that's, in a way, part of its power. Because these are all ideas that are floating within our circles. But the other thing that is distinctive, they are, for the most part, present framings that you will almost never hear in any public discussion. At the same time, and this is very important, most of the underlying values, and I'll say more about this later, are values that, in fact, most people share. Which means we don't necessarily have to change the values. We simply have to change the story so that we are validating those values rather than invalidating them. And I'm going to talk about the large frame of empire, which is a, a kind of a, an overall generic term for organization by dominator hierarchy. Important by a vast array of stories that we hear every day, but we don't normally think of them as empire stories, and that's part of the key. But once you begin to recognize them, you suddenly become aware of how totally pervasive they are. And that then becomes the frame of our work. We need to expose the reality of those stories and be coming forward with stories that counter the fallacies of those stories and help people and validate the values that people actually hold and awaken awareness of all of us to human possibilities that have been suppressed for literally 5,000 years. And part of what I'm going to be doing is um, the story I'm telling is in a sense the story that I've come to frame to communicate out to help people get a deeper understanding of the nature of our time and the nature of the choices. Now, this morning I made the assertion that the people in this room have the potential to change the story frame of our culture and to turn the human course. And that's not to suggest we do it just ourselves, but the, it, it, that statement is based on the incredible power of just a few people going out, voicing the new stories, voicing the truths that we share in a coherent way. And pretty soon people start saying, hey, I'm hearing that every place. You know, it may not be more than a half a dozen people, but as long as we position ourselves. <laughs> and, then, and that strengthens their courage to repeat the story, and pretty soon you've got a viral effect. Now, Okay, so here is, here is the way I'm framing the story. The day of reckoning for our reckless human ways has arrived. Global warming, end of cheap oil, exhaustion of fresh water, pending financial collapse, and spreading social disintegration. These are all consequences of the monumental balances that we humans have created in our relationships with one another and between ourselves and Earth. And the choices we humans make over the next five to ten years will determine whether the inevitable correction of these imbalances plays out as a suicidal last man standing competition for the last tree, the last blade of grass, drop of drinkable water, and breath of air. Now I recognize I'm using sexist language here, but this is sort of a guy kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> or it can play out as a cooperative sharing of those resources to actualize the creative potentials of our human nature. Potentials that I indicated have been suppressed and denied for 5,000 years. 
Now, every one of us is here at this event because we recognize that we live in a moment of extraordinary danger and extraordinary opportunity. And how that plays out will depend on the story field by which we understand the nature of the crisis and what it means in terms of the nature of the choices before us. Um, now, I don't have all the answers. One of the reasons I'm so delighted to be here, and particularly to have the opportunity to share this presentation with you, is that I'm continually growing, you know, as we've talked about before. Like, it, like all the rest of us, I'm making it up as I go along. And I'm hoping to get a lot of new insights out of our discussions here to carry this forward. I began the book with these prophetic opening words from the Earth Charter. We stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future. To move forward, we must recognize that in the midst of a magnificent diversity of cultures and life forms, we are one human family and one Earth community with a common destiny. Now, the establishment would have us believe that our problem is basically about technology. If we do enough market incentives to enough corporations, they will bring forward the new technologies and we can continue on living much as we have and the corporations will continue on making ever more profits. Uh, I think most of us in here recognize that that is not the answer. The foundational frame that to me is, is the heart of this, of, of understanding what we need to change, is that our choice is basically between two models for organizing human affairs. Two choices of how we structure our relationships. One is the dominator model of empire, and the other the partnership model of Earth community. And the new story field, among other things, identifies this choice as the defining choice of our time. Now, according to cultural historian Rian Eisler, our contemporary problem began some 5,000 years ago when our ancestors put aside the more egalitarian and generally gender balanced ways of many of the earlier human societies and made the first tragic turn from partnership relations of Earth community, which are symbolized here by the Stonehenge Circle of Life, to the dominator relations of empire, symbolized here by the Egyptian pyramids of power. Now, isn't it stunning how clearly this contrast is revealed in these ancient artifacts? As this played out, <clears throat> female gods were replaced by male gods, and we humans lost our attachment to Earth as the masculine drove out the feminine. <clears throat> Men took over to rule by bow and sword. And the brutal competition for power created a relentless kill or be killed, rule or be ruled dynamic of violence and oppression. Conquest became a measure of human greatness. The societies became divided between the rulers and the ruled, and relationships at all levels, from those among nation states, among those among states, city states at that time, to relationships among family members came to be structured by dominator hierarchy. And again, as this played out, women and people of color were eliminated from the competition. This is almost universal through all the, all the different empires. They were denied from positions of power and privilege simply by denying their humanity. The members of my generation will recall that within our lifetimes, there was actually active debate as to whether women and people of color actually have human souls. So we've resolved that debate. <laughs> the one other remaining issue is do white males have human souls? <laughs> Now, historians, this is, a, this is another thing that so blew me away as I began this research. Historians generally equate the beginnings of human civilization and progress with the onset of empire. That's one of the most basic empire stories. Now, empire is the source of, of our problems. Now, of course, the pre empire period of relative equality and gender balance was, in fact, the time of extraordinary creating progress for our species in discovering and cultivating most all the capacities and basically basic technologies that are distinctive to the human species. And these include the arts of spoken language, oral literature, subtle agriculture, textile weaving, clothing production, metallurgy, town planning, architecture, building highway construction, institutions of law government, and religion. All of this largely ignored by the historians who have us believe that human civilization began with empire. Uh, 
And of course, you have us believe that war is an essential condition for technological advance. Now, another thing that the historians rarely mention is that every empire in human history has exhibited three characteristics. First, empire reduces the vast majority of humans to conditions of deprivation and servitude that deny their rights and suppress their creative potential. Every empire in human history, including our own, has built its economy on a foundation of slavery or its equivalent. Now, one of the things to bear in mind, most of these things are so simple that we, we really need to stop and recognize the implications of the simple truth. If you organize a society with a few people on the top, duh, most people are going to be on the bottom. That creates an inexorable competition for power. And that explains so much of the dynamics of our society. Okay, second characteristic of empire. Empire diverts a major portion of the resources available to the human societies away from meeting the needs of people in nature in order to support the military forces, prisons, palaces, temples, retainers, and propagandists required to maintain the system of domination to secure the interests of the elite ruling class. And of course, they're defending those interests against the wrath of those excluded. And of course, <clears throat> little has changed. The fact that more than half of U.S. federal government discretionary spending goes to the military, and that's even before counting any of the costs of Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, is an indication of how little has changed over 5,000 years. A third characteristic of empire. The institutions of empire all too often elevate the most power-hungry and ethically challenged to the highest positions of power. <laughs> Perhaps some contemporary examples come to mind. <laughs> There will be no end to patriarchy, racism, violence, injustice, exclusion, and environmental destruction. Nor will we have true democracy until we turn from the domination of empire to the partnership of Earth community. At the deepest level are many progressive causes, but in fact one cause, and we must recognize this unifying truth to build a unifying movement. And that comes together around this change in the story frame. <coughs> and the time that we have to do this is now because empire has finally reached the limits of exploitation and exclusion that people and planet will tolerate. We must now navigate what Amadea Judith calls humanity's rite of passage from the love of power to the power of love. Now, uh, Amadea is right back here. Uh, I should tell you, I, I met Hannah Dea when I was giving a presentation in Sonoma, where she lives, and she handed me her book, and she says, this is the feminine version of the great term. <laughs> and I read it, and I concluded it's absolutely right. Um, she brings in more of the, of the psyche, the mythic, the heart dimension. And it's by bringing together these many dimensions in a richer and richer story that we, we, strengthen our, uh, we strengthen our work. Now, as Anadea points out, if we hold to the love of power, future generations will look back in frustration and anger on our time as the time of the great unravel, the time of planetary scale, environmental, and social collapse. The other side of this is that it is within our means to choose the power of love, and in so doing, bring forth a new era of Earth community. The Buddhist spiritual teacher, Joanna Macy, suggests that if we succeed, future generations may then speak of our time as the time of the great turning. Now, over the millennium, the primary institutional form of empire has morphed from the imperial city-states of ancient time to the imperial nation-states of the modern era, and most recently to the imperial global corporations that now dominate some of the <laughs> And throughout this, Oh, as much as things have changed throughout, we retain the underlying pattern of domination, alienation, and exclusion. Now, from time to time, someone will ask me, why are you so obsessed about corporations? After all, aren't they just communities of people? You know, instead of damning them, we simply need to appeal to their conscience to act in more socially and environmentally responsible ways and help, uh, help bring us out of this mess we're in. 
Now, this argument misses a critical point. They're not trained to think about institutional structures. Um, as some of you know, in terms of my background, uh, I actually come from a business school background with an MBA and PhD from the Stanford Business School and uh, I taught at the Harvard Business School. My field is organization, business organization. And that, you know, what I learned in my business school days ultimately connected with what I was experiencing out of 30 years working on it as an international development professional uh, on the quest to end global poverty. And gradually coming to realize that most of what we were doing in the name of development was in fact increasing poverty. And then I began to make this connection back to how our development models were serving the interests of global financial institutions, global corporations, and then reflecting on how those are structured, what the, they are, the imperatives that they create for the people within them. Now, so this is a key point. The purposes and values of particularly a publicly traded corporation, that's one of the, where you sell, buy and sell the shares in the, in the share, open share markets. The purpose and values are determined not by the people who the corporation employs, rather they're determined by law and by the dynamics of the financial markets, which virtually preclude real social and environmental responsibility. In a publicly traded corporation, money has more legal protections than either people or nature. Employees are required to leave their personal values at the door and are subject to instant arbitrary dismissal. And decisions are required to maximize the short-term financial interests of wealthy absentee owners without regard to human or natural consequences. Which means that far from functioning as a community of people, a publicly traded limited liability corporation is best understood as a gigantic pool of money with an artificial legal personality required by law to behave like a sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get clear on these things. <laughs> Um, this institution is an alien being that claims the rights of citizenship everywhere and denies the responsibilities of citizenship anywhere. And as such, it has no legitimate place in a just and democratic society. I would suggest that like monarchy, it must become an extinct institutional form. So part of this is changing the prevailing story in corporations. Now, the dream of reclaiming our power from this institutional monstrosity is no longer an idle fantasy. Um, actually, the most recent issue of Yes is just coming out. Those of you who are subscribers, it should be arriving in your mailbox. It's about reclaiming our power from corporations, and it's about a whole rethinking of, of that strategy. But that idea of reclaiming is no longer this idle fantasy because the institutional structure of the global corporate empire is destined to be stressed to its limits by the mounting forces of what I call a perfect economic storm, born of a convergence of peak oil, climate change, and a meltdown of the U.S. dollar. I think you're probably familiar with most of these ideas, but I'm going to go through them quickly so you can see how they, they come together. Peak oil occurs when global oil production peaks and begins its inexorable decline. This continued rise in demand sends prices soaring. Now, some experts believe that oil production has already peaked. Others predict it may not peak for another 20, even 30 years. But as Fortune magazine notes, that difference is basically irrelevant because the era of cheap oil is over and we have to eliminate our oil dependence. Now, here are implications for some of the ways in which our life will change. Long haul transport and global supply chains, which is the backbone of the corporate global economy, will become relics of the dying era. Auto dependent suburbia, strip malls, shopping centers, black stores like Walmart, located out in the middle of nowhere. Candidates for going out of business sales. Oil dependent agriculture, <coughs> running out of gas. Now look real closely here and tell me if you see any oil dependence. <laughs> This, of course, is the oil guzzling military hardware we depend on to secure our access to oil. 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 Hey, little chart group. <laughs> now, this is all becoming increasingly unaffordable, and as demonstrated most recently in Afghanistan, Iraq, and New Orleans, wholly ineffective against current security threats. Now, for more than a century, We've been building unsustainable economies dependent on a cheap oil subsidy that is fast disappearing. And as oil inexorably 
uh, prices inexorably rise, much of our existing capital stock will be reduced to what we call useless stranded assets. And this will include much of the supporting infrastructure of our sprawling and unsustainable suburbs. And for example, options for converting existing automobiles to other power sources may be limited. Although this is one biofuel prototype that is currently... <laughs>
these extraordinary things that have fundamentally changed our situation and totally changed our capacity to make decisions as a species. It was a little more than 60 years ago that we created the United Nations, which for all its imperfections made it possible for the first time in the human experience for representatives of all the world's peoples to come together in a neutral space to settle their differences through dialogue rather than force of arms. Never before in the human experience. It was only, it was less than 50 years ago that we humans ventured into space to look back and see ourselves as one people sharing a common destiny on a living spaceship fundamentally changing our perception of ourselves. And it's only been within the last 10 to 15 years that our communication technologies have given us the capability, should we choose to use it, to link every human on the planet into a seamless web of communication and cooperation. And together these, uh, these developments make it possible to make decisions of the species by conscious collective choice. Our future will be determined by how we now choose to use these capabilities. Now I want to turn to a metaphor that I know many of you are familiar with. The story of the metamorphosis of the caterpillar to the butterfly as told by evolution biologist Elizabeth Satoris. I see the very uh, nurturing metaphor for the, trans the, the, uh, the human turning from empire to earth community. The caterpillar is a voracious consumer that devotes its life to gorging on nature's bounty. When it's had its fill, it fastens itself to a convenient twig and wraps itself in a crystal to take a rest. Once stung inside, however, a crisis strikes as the structure, structures of its cellular tissue begin to dissolve into an organic soup. Now no, this represents disaster from the perspective of the caterpillar's lower worm nature. It represents opportunity from the perspective of its higher butterfly nature. Now, guided by some deep inner wisdom, a number of what scientists call organizer cells. I want you to repeat that with me. Organizer cells. A little louder. Organizer cells. Begin to get the picture here? <laughs> the organizer cells begin rushing around, gathering other cells into the formation of the magical buds. The imaginal buds are structures. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, boy, that's, I got a new crop. That's different. <laughs> you better hire that butterfly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> these, these imaginal cells can mm -hmm. take the form of the organs of a new creature. Now, as this takes place, the, what's left of the caterpillar's immune system perceives a threat to the established order and begins to attack the organizer cells and magical buds as alien intruders. <laughs> but the organizer cells ultimately triumph in the magical buds by linking together to form the new creature that defeats the, the, um, the resistance. And in its, in its rebirth, let's see here. Yeah. It prevailed by ultimately linking up in a cooperative emergent process that gives birth to a new creature of extraordinary beauty that lives likely on the earth, serves the regeneration of life by pollinating flowers, and in its rebirth has the capacity to traverse vast expanses of the North American continent to experience life's possibilities in ways the earthbound caterpillar could never have imagined. Let's hear it for the organizer cells. Yeah. Now, as our familiar institutional structures disintegrate around us, we humans stand on the threshold of a rebirth no less dramatic. The transformation of the caterpillar is physical. Ours, if we are successful, will be cultural and spiritual. And whereas the caterpillar faces an outcome preordained by the experience of countless generations before and deeply embedded in its genetic structure, we humans are path-breaking pioneers in uncharted territory. And our success depends on exercising our human capacity for conscious and creative choice. Okay. Now, unfortunately, our ability as a society to make the obvious choice for life in this term is seriously hampered by the work of a small group of committed political extremists. 
who claim to be conservative defenders of family values. Yet when in power, they cut programs that benefit children, families, communities, and nature in order to finance tax cuts for the rich, subsidies to crony corporations, and wars of imperial domination and occupation. Now, part of what's interesting is these acts are wholly at odds with what most Americans consider to be conservative values. And they, of course, constitute an all-out war against our children, families, communities, and nature. <clears throat> the extremists behind this tragedy have effectively hijacked the term conservative, um, and they have hijacked both the Republican and Democratic parties to circumvent democracy and take control of our country. Here, here. Now we the people, must take our country back. To do so, we must first understand how we lost it. So many of you ever ask yourselves how the self-serving champions of elite power and corporate greed have achieved the willing participation of so many of us in working against the values we hold most dear? Story, story. Yeah. Well, there's a simple but profound answer that connects right back into our work here. As we've been discussing, we humans live by the stories that define our values and our understanding of our relationship to one another and to creation. Whoever controls the stories controls the human course. Mm -hmm. Authentic cultural stories are told by authentic storytellers and artists engaged in interpreting the values and aspirations of authentic communities. In our society, however, the storytelling function has been largely taken over by propagandists and advertisers on the paywalls to imperial politicians and imperial corporations, and then constantly repeated through the echo chambers of the corporate media. And in so doing, it creates a cultural trance that blinds us to our higher human possibilities. So just keep your eye focused on that spinning spiral there and go shopping. <laughs> now, this misdirection plays out in the prevailing stories that define the public discourse on prosperity, security, and meaning. These stories are so pervasive that have become so much taken for granted that most of us never give a thought to how they serve ends wholly at odds with reality and with our own well-being. And they do this by alienating us from our deep and essential connection to one another and to Earth. Having created that alienation, that sense of emptiness, they come right back and say, we can Sure, your sense of insecurity, your loss of connection, your sense of alienation, um, if you simply result to the conditions of elite rule, buy our products, submit to our politicians, whatever. Now, let's go through these stories one by one. According to the imperial prosperity story, economic growth fills our lives with limitless material abundance, lifts the poor from their misery, and creates the wealth needed to protect the environment. To improve the lives of all, the rational human course is to make money the measure of every choice and relationship and to free wealthy investors from the taxes and regulations that limit their ability to accumulate the fortunes that allow them to invest to create the new jobs that enrich us all. The free market then allocates their investments to the uses that bring the greatest benefit to all. So if a few rich people get rich, Celebrate their good fortune, because as the rich get richer, we all get richer as the wealth trickles down. So in poverty, not by taxing the rich, but by eliminating the welfare programs that create poverty, by stripping the poor of their motivation to become productive members of society, willing to work at whatever jobs the market chooses to offer them. God bless America. God bless America. Yes. There's a patriot. <laughs> Have you ever heard that story? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I've been it in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much made its way around the world. And of course, most of it is nonsense. But there's just enough truth to it to make it sound plausible. Here's the reality Modern societies have for more than 50 years defined human progress in terms of economic growth. By this measure, we've enjoyed enormous economic success. Just since 1970, global economic consumption has tripled, which has made a great deal of money for a few people. Then there's the cost. The Living Planet Index is a measure of the health of the world's freshwater, ocean, and land-based ecosystems. In short, the life support system of the planet. And arguably, the measure of all real wealth. 
think about it. No life support system, no life, no life. Hey, no shopping. No shopping. No shopping. Yeah, no shopping. Boom, boom. Uh, of course, this index of planetary health has declined some 30% since 1970. So, despite what economic growth indicators are telling us, we are in fact getting poorer as a, by the day as a species. Now, the good news, at least from the perspective of the planet, is that the species responsible for this devastation will be gone long before this index reaches zero. <laughs> now one of the many lessons that I learned during my years working abroad was that much of what we call development is actually a process by which the land and water resources on which the majority of the world's people depend for their modest livelihoods, are expropriated to make way for dams, mines, shrimp farms, agricultural estates, golf courses, uh, <coughs> suburban sprawl, <coughs> shopping centers, all supporting the often extravagantly wasteful lifestyles of those who are already better off. Mm -hmm. That's when I began to recognize this pattern that my whole relationship to the aid system began to change. To put it in simple language, Conventional economic growth indicators measure the rate at which the productive resources of the poor are being expropriated by the rich and converted to garbage at an accelerated rate. <laughs> and all of this to make money for people, mostly for people who already have more money than they need. That's what, that's what the, the real story behind this development story. Now as a result of this, we are seeing an ever more grotesque global maldistribution of asset ownership. According to a recent UN study, the richest 1% of households on the earth own 70% of all global assets. The next richest 1% own an additional 11%. This little sliver down at the bottom is the 1% of assets shared by the poorest 50% of the world's households. Now, think about what this means. This distribution of ownership is in fact a proxy major the global distribution of power. And the gap is growing at an accelerating rate. And the greater the inequality, the greater the power of the ruling elite to change the rules to accelerate their expropriation of an even larger share. At the same time, squeezing desperate workers to accept ever lower wages and an ever lower share. And the result is a suicidal downward spiral of social and environmental devastation. There's some very key implications here. The economic challenge of our time is not to grow up our economies. Now this is where we get into some really difficult stuff. Taking on economic growth is really attacking the, the, sacred, uh, the, the sacred truth of the temple. Um, now, the real goal must be to reallocate our use of Earth's available productive resources to reduce destructive uses, increase beneficial uses, and give priority to those most in need. We can reallocate from military expenditures to health care and environmental rejuvenation, from automobiles to public transportation, from investing in suburban sprawl to investing in compact communities and reclaiming forests and agricultural land, from advertising to education, and from financial speculation to investment in local entrepreneurship. And we know that each of these reallocations can actually result in improving the quality of our lives. On a finite planet, sustainability and equity are inexorably linked. Reallocation has become a moral and practical imperative. And the most important part of this redistribution is redistribution from the rich to the poor. Now again, that is a truth that nobody wants to talk about. It is the truth that we need to begin to bring forward and speak openly. Okay. Now we come to the imperial securities. <clears throat> we live in a dangerous world filled with evil enemies who hate us for our freedoms. Our security depends on strong police and military forces to control and eliminate criminals, terrorists, and rogue dictators. If we trust in our leaders who command state power, they will keep us safe. 
But beware of those who side with our enemies by questioning our leaders as they are also our enemies. Heard this one recently? Yeah. 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 yeah, okay. So this story promises security and liberty in return for submission to a system that secures the liberty and privilege of the ruling class. I don't know if you've noticed the Time article on Inside the Bush Dynasty. Um, <coughs> And does all of this at the expense of peace and the liberty and creativity of the rest of us. Now this brings us to the imperial meaning story, or creation story, I'm sorry. Uh, this brings us to our imperial meaning or creation stories. Basically our meaning stories usually take the form of our creation stories. These are the stories to which we turn for answers to the deepest questions about the nature and purpose of our existence. Now back in 1994, when I was writing the epilogue to the first edition of When Corporations Rule the World, I was struggling to understand a common reaction to my observation in many of the groups that I met with, that we humans were headed down a path to social and environmental self-destruction. I'd often get a response along these lines. Well, that's true, we are headed towards self-destruction, but it would be so expensive and inconvenient to change. <laughs> It was like people were saying, what's the profit in human survival? <laughs> well, no, the party's over when the last light goes out. As I was struggling to sort out why survival wasn't a sufficient motivator for change, <laughs> I struggled with this question. I came across Thomas Berry's Dream of the Earth. And what you observed that for people generally, the story of the universe and the human role in the universe is their primary source of intelligibility and value. The deepest crises experienced by any society are those moments of change when the story becomes inadequate for meeting the survival demands of a present situation. Bingo. I realized that was the key. To make the changes essential to our survival, we humans must have a creation story that makes our survival meaningful. And this, of course, is a theme central to the work that our very own Michael Dow is carrying forward, and which we'll hear more about tomorrow. It's the theme of his book, Thank God for Revolution. Now, I'm going to provide kind of an introduction to this topic, which Michael's going to take to a much deeper level. I assume you're all familiar with the current debate between two competing imperial creation stories. One is the imperial religion story of a patriarchist creationism, and the other is the imperial science story of a materialist <coughs> evolutionism. Now, according to patriarchist creationism, the distant God created heaven and earth and gave man dominion over them in return for faithful obedience. He rewards the righteous with wealth and power and commissions them to rule over the slothful sinners whom he condemns to poverty and misery. Surrounded and polluted by evil and unworthy of salvation except by divine grace, we humans can only hope for salvation in the afterlife and return for belief and obedience in this life to God the Father and to those who rule in his name. And I know many of you are familiar with the rapture story. Believers in the rapture, the prophecy that Christ will return at a time of darkness to lift the faithful bodily to heaven. For these folks, the primary goal in life is to get out of here as quickly as possible to be in relation to God. Yep. And if any of you have ever seen the rapture index on the web, mm -hmm. if you haven't, Google the rapture index. It will take you to this page where the... the happily tracks the increase in human crisis because it means we're getting closer to the rapture. Okay. <coughs> now, according to materialist evolutionism, the universe is best understood as a mechanical <coughs> clockworks. It was set in motion at the beginning of time and is gradually running down to a heat death as its spring unwinds. <coughs> Only the material is real. Life is nothing more than an accidental outcome of material complexity. Consciousness and free will are illusions. Life has evolved through genetic mutation and a competitive struggle in which the most fit survive and the unfit perish. Theories of Darwinian competition, selfish genes, and economic man <clears throat> tell us it is our human nature to be individualistic competitors and profligate consumers. 
Competition for wealth and power is the natural order, and victory is proof of superior wealth. You begin to see the implications of these creation stories. And so although seemingly in conflict, both the patriarchist creationism story and the materialist evolutionism stories both serve to alienate, to alienate us from our sense of connection to earth and earthly community. Both deny our human capacity to form caring, cooperative communities grounded in a sense of mutual caring and respect. And both affirm dominator hierarchy as the natural order. Neither of these prevailing stories give particular meaning to our lives or a compelling reason to sacrifice immediate material indulgence for long-term species survival. Together, they, shape major, they share major responsibility for the spiritual crisis that now threatens our collective survival. So now I want to turn to the Earth community uh, stories, because Earth community has its own prosperity, security, meaning stories. Stories that affirm our connection to one another at Earth, and stories that we know in our hearts to be true, but which are constantly denied by the prevailing cultural stories. The Earth community prosperity story teaches us that Healthy children, families, communities, and living systems are the true measure of real wealth. That mutual caring is the primary currency of healthy families and communities. They teach us that we increase real wealth by investing resources in growing the social capital of caring relationships and the natural capital of the healthy ecosystems. They teach us that we end poverty and heal the environment by reallocating material resources from rich to poor and from life destructive to life nurturing uses. Within this story, markets have a vital role, but markets must have rules to secure community interests by internalizing costs, maintaining equity, and favoring human-scale local businesses that honor community values and serve community needs. Then we turn to the Earth Community Security Story. <clears throat> it teaches that crime and war are actually indicators of failed relationships. They teach that strong, caring communities are an essential foundation of true security as they build trust, share risks, and create resilience in the face of crisis. They teach that retribution against wrongdoers perpetuates violence while healing troubled relationships eliminates the cause of violence. So now I want to turn to the Earth Community Meaning Story, which is foundational to the new, uh, new uh, story field. And, yeah. and I, I find great inspiration here, particularly in the work of Marcus Bohr, who is a popular Christian writer. His defining statement that just captured my imagination the first time I heard it is, tell me your image of God, and I will tell you your politics. <laughs> just think about that for a minute, that you can figure it out. The image of God as jealous patriarch in the sky creates a hierarchy of righteousness and leads to a politics of power and domination. By contrast, the image of God as an integral spirit from which all being manifests leads to a politics of love and partnership, the politics of earth community. Of course, we've got a bit of a problem here because the very term God almost inevitably evokes an image of the distant patriarch. Um, <coughs> Now, in stark contrast to the empire meaning stories that give us a choice between a dead and meaningless universe and a universe ruled by a distant and jealous patriarch, the earth community meaning story celebrates the integral spiritual intelligence from which all being manifests. It proclaims that life is a fundamentally cooperative enterprise in which the species that survive and prosper are in fact those that find their place of service to creation's epic creative search for unrealized possibilities. Overall, the story tells us that far from being lost souls in a dead or evil universe, we humans are in fact participants in the greatest of all creative adventures. Learn the story. Michael's going to tell us more about it tomorrow. To survive and prosper, humans must discover and cultivate our human gift of service as co-creators in a conscious, self-organizing cosmos. We now face our final examination to determine whether we are a species worthy of survival. A passing grade will require a sweeping cultural and institutional transformation. Now, the Earth Community Meaning Story draws from the data of science, draws from the teachings of Jesus, all the world's great spiritual traditions, and research on the development of 
the mature human consciousness from infancy to elderhood. And together, they tell us the story. It presents a very different picture of our human nature from that of the imperial meaning stories. Now, as every parent knows, we each come into this world as self-centered beings who live fully in the present, are aware only of our own immediate comfort and discomfort, are incapable of recognizing and accepting responsibility for our own actions, and are dependent on magical protectors for our survival. This, of course, is why children need parents. We each have the potential, however, if we receive the necessary supports from family and community, to achieve, ultimately, the inclusive spiritual and wisdom consciousness of the revered statesperson, teacher, tribal elder, or religious sage, who use all of creation as an integral evolving whole and whose life is dedicated to selfless service to the good of all. So strip away the self-imposed pathologies of empire, and we find that we humans are in fact wired to connect, to form and to live in community. Now, the most highly developed spiritual consciousness finds its expression <clears throat> in the great religious mystics. The Earth Community Meaning Story recognizes that we are a species of many different natures, many different potentials. What makes us distinctively human is our capacity to choose, including our capacity, quite literally, to choose our nature. At least how our nature manifests. Now, <clears throat> Note that in the course of this discussion, I have defined three competing creation stories featuring three very different premises about the existence and locus of the guiding intelligence or lack thereof. The story of the patriarch tells of an external intelligence that plays out in a human politics of domination and violence. The story of science tells of a mechanistic cosmos devoid of intelligence that plays out in a human politics of greed and material excess. The story of the spirit model tells of an integral intelligent manis intelligence manifest in all being that plays out in a politics of love, compassion, and sharing. And I think this is an essential framework for understanding and thinking about our story telling work. So, I suggest to you, tell me what image of God frames the global culture, and I will tell you the fate of humanity. Mm -hmm. Domination and violence, greed and material excess, or love and sharing. Earth community stories teach reverence for the sacred grandeur and beauty of all creation. They call us to act as responsible, caring adults, and they affirm our capacity to form authentic, inclusive, deeply democratic communities grounded in mutual love and responsibility. Communities that support every person in discovering <coughs> and expressing their special gifts. Now this brings us back to the basic premise of the story field conference. To change the human course, change the story field. We must find the courage to break the silence and speak openly the truth in our hearts so that we can reach out to end our individual isolation by joining with others, to form authentic communities grounded in the principles of partnership, communities that grow and link. And as we find our common voice, we will change the prevailing cultural stories, end the cultural trance, liberate the higher orders of human consciousness, and turn the human course. Now millions of people around the world are already experiencing an awakening to the possibility of birthing a new human era grounded in principles of Earth community. Principles that transcend traditional human barriers of race, class, religion, and nationality. This awakening is most powerfully manifest in a newly emergent social phenomenon we call global civil society. It's very important to begin understanding this as a self-organizing, planetary-scale social organism that now functions as a shared conscience of the species. It gathers annually at the World Social Forum. And on February 15, 2003, it brought more than 10 million people to the streets of the world's cities and towns to oppose the violence of the planned U.S. invasion of Iraq. Now what's so significant about this, so distinctive, is the fact that it is self-organized through the leadership of millions of people without the benefit of any central budget, uh, central organization, not even a charismatic leader standing up and saying, follow me. It is really important to understand this fundamental shift because we are so conditioned to look for
before the leader on the white horse will come riding in to save us from ourselves. That's the empire model. You know, our path to earth community must be expressed through the very means that are consistent with the end that we seek, which is why this upwelling is so important. And of course, this phenomenon is the greatest assurance we have that the shift is taking place and assurance of the possibilities within our reach. It is unprecedented in the human experience. The Yes Magazine, we call it a conspiracy of hope. <coughs> uh, I should know, if any of you don't know, my reference is to Yes Magazine, I'm the co-founder and board chair, so these are, these are all <laughs> snuck in here. <laughs> you can't totally get away from, from that. So another question. If any of you ever wondered how could we possibly hope to build a consensus commitment to Earth community values in our politically divided nation? Has that ever occurred to you? Now, this, this question leads to another very important truth. For all the talk of red states and blue states, our polling data indicate that in fact we as Americans uh, have substantial agreement on many key issues. Mm -hmm. We are, in fact, far more perfect than we realize. For example, 90% of us agree that big companies have too much power. I think that's the basis for a terrific conversation about democracy. 83% of us believe that as a society, the United States is focused on the wrong priorities. Super majorities of more than 60% want to see greater priority given to the needs of children, families, communities, and nature. You begin to put this picture together, and you see um, you see that Americans, in fact, want a world that puts people ahead of profits, spiritual values ahead of financial values, and international cooperation ahead of international domination. There's a very important thing to note about these values. You cannot clearly identify any of them as distinctively either conservative values or distinctively liberal values. They are simply deeply shared human values. We are, in fact, one nation yearning for the children, families, communities, and natural environments. Okay, I want to see some hands here again. Do you think big business has too much power? Oh, yeah. Well, look at that. <laughs> Do you think as a nation we're focused on the wrong priorities? No, you don't think we're focused on the wrong priorities? Oh, yeah, but I don't know. One of you saw him was leaving. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, it seems like we're pretty much on the same page with the rest of the country. I don't bet that some of you came in here believing that you were members of a fringe minority. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, we are the leading edge of a national supermajority, and it's time for us to think, speak, and act accordingly and with courage. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our political, now I want, to, I want to go through one more story that is key to our work and our thinking of ourselves as a nation. Our political leaders regularly proclaim their intention to spread democracy to other countries, most recently to Iraq. Now, I happen to be a person who believes in democracy. I think democracy is a very good thing. In fact, I believe it is such a good thing, it would be a great idea to try it here. In <laughs> I suspect I'm... This is another, you know, this is another one of these contrasting stories that we need to address. And I suspect I'm not the only one here who, who grew up as a child cherishing the story that the founding fathers who wrote our Constitution acted out of a passionate belief in life, liberty, and justice for all, and gave us governing institutions that embody the highest expression of these democratic ideals. And we don't have to stop to think about it very long to realize that the truth is rather more complicated than that simple story. <clears throat> Now, those who drafted the U.S. Constitution do deserve credit for two monumental contributions to democracy. They brought an end to hereditary monarchy. They also introduced the separation of church and state, which brought an end to theocracy, which was deeply embedded in the old columns and is ruled by, uh, ruled by religion. Beyond that, however, much of our cherished national story is a self-serving and self-limiting myth that serves the interest by denying the need for continuing struggle in pursuit of the democratic ideal. Mm -hmm. Now, let's consider these well-known facts that are quite beyond dispute. Our Constitution was written by white males of the property classes. If you read it carefully within the context of the time, it becomes clear we wrote it to 
enshrine their own power in the institutions of a plutocracy, which is ruled by people of wealth. And that system, of course, prevails to this day. Now, in terms of the other realities, the land we occupy was taken by force and deceit from Native Americans, whose treaty rights uh, continue to be ignored with alarming regularity. Much of our land was worked by slaves whose descendants still suffer the consequences. And of course, women didn't get the vote until 1920 and remained significantly underrepresented in political office. In the words of Francis Moore LePay, to save the democracy we thought we had, we must take to democracy to where it has never been. Yes. Democracy is an unfinished project. So here we are at a defining <coughs> We humans face an unprecedented choice to give up the reckless ways of our species' adolescence and, expect, and accept responsibility for one another on Earth or continue on a path to collective suicide. And in its profound wisdom, the spiritual force of creation is calling us to take the step to a new level of species maturity and find our place of service in the larger scheme of creation. And we waited our, at our peril for the leadership in this great work to come from within the institutions of empire which would include global corporations, national governments, and of course our national political parties. Leadership in the Great Turning must come from people like us acting as the organizer selves of a new era, working from the bottom up through our local governments, businesses, churches, educational institutions, and civic organizations, including those engaged in the arts, to build vital democratic communities that serve as the imaginal buds of a new era. And of course, millions of people are already engaged in this great work, including every person in this room. They're rebuilding local economies, campaigning for peace, sharing the stories of a new culture that celebrates the higher orders of human consciousness. They're creating liberated cultural spaces that nurture the development of mature consciousness. They're promoting living wage, advancing minority rights, reforming electoral processes, running for office, reviving local agriculture, organizing discussion groups on the stories from the young, creating intentional communities, promoting rebuilding solar energy, developing interfaith alliances, practicing holistic medicine, hosting local progressive talk 